hack into cybersecurity? There's a ton of content out there, and if you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. What's cracking? Welcome to the show. Hold on. I, <laughs> no matter what I do, there's always like a little bit more for me to do after we go live. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday, August 29th, 2023. Welcome to episode number 440 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Brief podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier. And over the next 45 minutes, Thomas Robertson, quiet gamer, not only IT, Carrie. Folks over on LinkedIn, Pastor Muppets coming in hot on Discord, the mod team, LinkedIn, YouTube, squad members, Simply Cyber community members, first timers and long timers. We're all going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day, and I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner, or if you're looking to break in the industry, we got you covered. Whether it's tactical implementation of the knowledge that we're going to gain today, or it's crushing a job interview because you're just like mic dropping every answer, you're gonna you're gonna get massive value from this. Also, quick aside, you know that movie with Johnny Depp, Cry Baby, or whatever from like the mid '90s? He's got this like one piece of hair that hangs down. That's what's going on right here. I'm just seeing it now on camera, and uh, that might be a co-host for today's episode. Stay tuned. I'm not sure where I'm not sure where this is gonna go. <laughs> All right, guys, if you're here live in chat, welcome Jeff Wittal with a squad membership. What's up, Jeff? Thanks so much for the support. Holla. So if you're live in chat, 119 of you today, maybe we'll push through and break the record. Current record, 366 concurrent live members. Absolutely stunning. You guys are amazing. If you are live, though, hashtag team live in chat. Let us uh, No, not Donnie Brasco. It was definitely crybaby or he was definitely called crybaby. Um, it, it was like a it was like a teen angst drama, except it was you know Johnny Depp, so it was a little uh, weird. Anyways, if you are live with us today, hashtag Team Live. Jesse Johnson getting up early, or well, that baby's keeping him up uh, all night. Who knows? Base case in the house. Not sure if you want to wait until mid roller jaw jacking to talk about it. But guess what? Base case started a new role. Oh yeah. Our very own base case mod. Mod extraordinaire, audio engineer, longtime Simply Cyber community member, Base Case, taking on a new role. Congratulations, Base. I know you're going to absolutely dominate it, um, just like you dominate everything else you do. All right, guys, hashtag Team Live. We're celebrating people's wins today, which is epic. If you're watching on replay, replay your people too. Holla, hashtag Team Replay in the comments. Make sure whether you're live or on replay, guys, grab a, grab a uh, screen cap, take a, take a picture uh, with you saying what's up or team live or whatever in chat, uh, file it away. Half a CPE, they stack up two and a half a week, 10 a month. Uh, get those CPEs, be part of the community. Uh, we have a good time, but we're also doing work here too. So work doesn't work and fun don't have to be mutually exclusive. That's That doesn't have to happen, and we're proving it here every day. Now, I do want to say shout out to the passive observers, a.k.a. lurkers, a.k.a. Rick Storm, if he's in the crowd. I had someone named Rick Storm reach out to me and say he's been, he's been a long-time lurker, just kind of leaves it on while he's getting ready in the morning. Uh, so if you're a passive observer, let us know in chat. Take a second, walk over to the to the chat screen, pull up the keyboard bar on your mobile device, hashtag passive observer. Get those CPEs, but more importantly, step into the light of social networking 
on professional platforms during professional podcasts like this. Believe me, guys, networking is going to go a, a wicked long way. We could talk more about that at the um, uh, Simply Cyber Community Challenge. And then finally, finally, we got 174 people in here already coming coming in hot at already five minutes into the show. If this is your first episode, if this is your first episode of the podcast, whether someone told you about it, you stumbled on it by yourself, whatever, hashtag first timer in chat. We love welcoming our first timers. You better believe that. Now, before we get into the show, oh, and by the way, production note, um, the blog posts weren't made already, so I have zero clue what stories are coming. I never research or prepare for any of the stories, so if you didn't know that, now you do. So you're getting my honest reaction to every story and my you know, 20 years of experience thoughts on it. But I, I don't even know what the stories are today, so like I'll be pulling these up in real time as, um, as we're going. But before we get into it, let me... Uh, let me thank some of the stream sponsors who are making, you know, they, they basically sponsor the stream and make it possible for me to get up every morning at 7 a.m. and get my, my crap together. <laughs> Starting with Barricade Cyber Solutions. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions, Eric Taylor and his group, they know how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Believe that. <clears throat> I believe in them enough and represent them that uh, they actually have an emote in the squad emote tray. There you go. So Michael McBride knows what's up. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. Link in the description below. At minimum, bookmark them and put break glass them in case of emergency. That's who you should call. Also want to say shout out to Panopsi Security. Get a partner who understands your cyber program and your business goals. Eric Taylor dropping a 50 bomb. Ooh! Hold on. Hold on. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Catch me outside. How about that? Oh, uh, like just hyper melting uh, the stream. Eric Taylor. So, hey, congratulations to the 50 new squad members. If you're a squad member, don't be shy. Get into that emo tray. The Oprah would definitely be the one that you'd want to get giddy up on first. All right, guys, Panopsi, your cyber budget and team deserve a consultant who understands your risk, resources, and program. You can contact Panopsi, and they can help you stop being reactive to cyber issues and become proactive. Project a three-year roadmap. Understand where your spends are going to be. Understand what your largest cyber risks are and how to reduce them in a meaningful way, okay? Believe that. Hold on, let me do something really quick. Make sure... Dude, what is going on? Everybody's like freaking out about this hurricane. Like, what are we talking about? Did, has it escalated? Like, my phone has just been blowing up. Like, I'm going to have to check the weather. All right. Holler at Panopsi. I also want to say shout out to Anti-Siphon Training, Anti-Siphon, uh, but more about them at the mid-roll. Reminder, it is Tuesday. Um, I do teach at the Citadel right now on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so I will be um, not doing jaw jacking today unless we can giddy up real hardcore on the uh, morning news but for now do me a favor it is tidbits tuesday so look forward to that a little bit later do me a favor sit back relax and let the cool sounds look at this got some of this uh going here <laughs> i don't even know what this is i got some of this going sit back relax and let let the cool sound of the hot news Freshy! wash over us in an awesome wave here we go from the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. It's Tuesday, August 29th, 2023. UK network outage grounds flights. On August 28th, the UK's National Air Traffic Service, or NATS, announced a technical issue causing it to apply traffic flow restrictions to maintain safety. This resulted in flight controllers having to input flight plans manually, resulting in a trickle of usual air traffic volume. Through mid-afternoon, roughly 500 flights saw cancellations or multiple-hour delays, most from London's Heathrow Airport. Nats announced it identified and remedied the issue at 3.15 p.m. local time, but flight disruptions could persist for days. Nats announced no further details on what caused the issue at the time of this recording. All right, so Nats, uh, Josh Mason's in chat. I mean, he's a uh, pilot. 
Uh, we've seen NATS, which is, I think, national air travel system, and it basically, um, I think it's what the ATCs use, the air traffic controllers. Uh, you can see here, um, it, it, but here's the thing. It's a system. Um, it's very important. So if we don't have NATS, here's the thing. You could take off in a plane, but if you have no idea what else is flying around or who's cleared for takeoffs, or you're going to land on top of a plane that's trying to take off, or heaven forbid, something even more awful like what happened, I think the Canary Islands in the 70s, where two freaking planes took off like, like on both ends of the runway at each other and it was all foggy and they basically just like did like a high speed uh, head on collision into each other on the runway. Like we don't screw around. And you know what? I, dude, I'm the first guy who will lose his mind about air travel, uh, about flight travel con issues. My flight to Vegas got delayed 30 hours and I was wicked pissed. But you know what? I'm not super angry about flying in in, in even a, a, mo a modicum of danger, right? Like we have these systems in place because um, <laughs> they protect us and they're almost always based on some prior terrible accident that led to the uh, introduction of additional controls, additional things, right? So th this story is kind of um, a bit of a reach, right? Automation failure was a cyber attack to blame. Like, Okay, guys, like there's no, it seems like there's no indication that there's cyber here, but really important system. So let's, let's throw cyber at it. If anything, just, this just goes to show you how ubiquitous and per, per, pervasive cybersecurity is in our modern society. Almost everything runs on technology now, right? So if anything goes awry, uh, is cyber to blame? You know, it could be Carl. Oh! doing a, a scheduled maintenance and forgot to, you know, turn things back on or, or hit the wrong button or wrong IP range, right? Like accidents happen, all these things. There was a story last year uh, of this NAT system being impacted in the United States, and it was tied somehow to a, um, I want to say it was tied to a cyber attack for real. But anyways, long story short, if you're flying in the UK, you're probably aware of this because it probably impacted you in some negative way. Um, but... I guess the final thing I'll say about this is there it actually this is a good one. If you do work in this space somehow and you don't know about it, there is an aviation ISAC um worth checking out, okay? This is, so the ISACs there's one for not every industry has one and, and this one's a really specific one, but there's a healthcare one that's really good, there's a financial services one that's very good. There is a um like uh, state and local government one that's okay. Uh, anyways, there's an aviation one. So if you do work in this space, if this somehow did impact you uh, and you're not a member of this ISAC, you absolutely should investigate it. The malware loader, Big Three. A new report from the security firm ReliaQuest claims that the malware loaders Qbot, Sock Ghoulish, and Raspberry Robin account for 80% of observed attacks in 2023. The three remain fairly close in market share, with QBot the most common, used in 30% of attacks. The report found the remaining top seven used in low single-digit percentages. QBot also proved the most adaptable, perhaps why the one-time banking Trojan has been around for the past 16 years. Sock Ghoulish targets Windows and shows ties to the Russian-linked group Evil Corp in the past. Raspberry Robin also targets Windows, starting out as a USB drive worm, and since then it's been used by both Clop and Lockbit to load ransomware. All right, so a couple things. One, uh, he's calling it Qbot um, in the story, right? You heard him say Qbot. Uh, but you tell me in chat, right? Because a lot of times we just read these things. We don't say these things out loud. Um, and, you know, you might say I'm wrong. This Qbot is called Quackbot, like a duck. Like quack, 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 quack. Okay, so Quackbot. So you may hear it referred to as Quackbot as well. Um, just so you all know, um, again, thank you to Eric Taylor and Barricade Cyber for the squad memberships. Guys, if you are one of the lucky uh, 100 people that have become a Simply Cyber squad member uh, because of uh, Barricade Cyber, please make your first uh, squad emote a Barricade Cyber logo. Thank you again, Eric Taylor, always uh, a partner of the, uh, the community and a member of the community, frankly. 
Okay, so guys, really quickly, what are we talking about here? Loaders are like your initial, your initial kind of like, think of, do you remember in the Matrix when, um, like the original Matrix, not the, not the, not that ridiculous rehash that they did. I think that was like straight to Netflix, that, that ridiculous one. Don't even get me started. Like, I don't know why I'm so angry about that rehash one, but at, oh my God, remind me of Tidbit Tuesday. It almost reminds me of how they rehashed Star Wars, A New Hope with whatever that reboot thing was. Freaking cash grab. Okay, here's the deal. Do you remember when in the Matrix, when they're driving around in the Nebuchadnezzar, and if you don't know the Matrix, I'm sorry. Basically, they're flying around in their uh, boat uh, spaceship, and there's like this like hunter gatherer droid that looks like an octopus with a bunch of tentacles, and like it grabs onto the boat uh, or the ship with like some of its tentacles, and then it uses other tentacles to like cut a hole in the wall, and, or and then rip rip the um, the boat open. I keep calling it a boat, but it's like a ship. It's a spaceship. It's which is like a space boat, right? Anyways, it, it it pulls it off and then it drives its head in, and then it starts causing uh wreck in there. Okay, that's what initial loaders do, right? They're lightweight. You don't think of malware as like this entire solution, right? You always hear like the Trojan horse, and it's like they're wheeling this big piece of malware in. No. A lot of times there'll be this lightweight piece that comes in, smacks in there, gets its little tentacles in there, and then it reaches out to C2 and pulls down second stage payloads. And this is where you start getting like Cobalt Strike or, you know, post-exploitation frameworks. And once they set up shop, right, then they start pulling down, you know, modules and all these other things. So think of it as like a forward base. And then you call in reinforcements and you get like a more permanent base, right? With like, you know, a fort around it and maybe like, you know, a campfire and stuff. And then you start bringing in the specialists like, oh, we've got a, we've got a lumberjack over here and we've got a cook over here, right? Hopefully these metaphors make sense. But my point is that's what these loaders are doing. Now, Qbot, Sock Goalish, Raspberry Robin are the most popular ones. So as a practitioner, what I would think you should be doing is... You can go get to be very careful if you do this, guys. Um, go, you can go get Qbot, Sock Goalish, and Raspberry Robin. You can download these, okay? And I know that sounds ridiculous, but believe me, you can. Malware, and do not do this if you don't know what you're doing, okay? Like, I cannot caution you enough. I like to go to Malware Bazaar, right? Um, oh, let me just do this really quickly. Uh, yeah, I'm not a robot. Who is this stopping, by the way? The I'm not a robot. AI can solve those things. Like, I'm not a robot? Like, th that's like, that's such a, a yesteryear thing. What are we doing? Okay. See, I typed in QBot. Obviously, that didn't work. Let's type in QuackBot. Obviously, that didn't work. Uh, Robin. That didn't work. Okay, so now I just look like a fool. This is what we're doing. Oh, my God. Um, hold on. This will work. Uh, let me see. Uh, site. Do a little Google foo on this thing. And then Raspberry Robin. Here we go. Okay, there we go. So see, you can easily download, um, a copy of this Raspberry Robin, right? And I would recommend you download a copy of Sock Ghoulish and Cubot. Again, be incredibly careful. Do not do this if you don't know what you're doing. But what you can do is you could take your EDR solution, like your CrowdStrike or your Microsoft Defender or whatever, you know, uh, poor man's version of whatever that, you know, your company can afford if you're like a low budgeted company or InfoSec's not getting any love, right? Whatever it is. In, on a machine that you've imaged, right? Or do it in a VM with no network connections, detonate the QBot or detonate the Raspberry Robin and see if your EDR catches it. If it doesn't, you've got, you've got problems, right? You may want to either talk to your vendor about, Hey, can you make detections for this? Or look th at that point, you could start doing threat hunting. Okay. And start looking for what the heck does Raspberry Robin do? There's plenty of information on it. You could probably go to MITRE ATT&CK and figure it out. But Look at what Raspberry Robin does. What processes does it spin up? And then write your own custom detection. You might even be able to Google to, uh, custom detections Raspberry Robin. My point is, do not just, I don't know why I'm railing against EDRs now. Guys, what a day. Listen, the point is you can't just assume that you buy some solution turnkey and you're good to go. It's taco time, baby. 
No, you have to confirm that it will detect and handle these malwares. And if these three are 80% of all intrusions initial loader, you can prioritize the crap out of these things because you have a four out of five chance of these one of these three being what punches you in the mouth. So invest in yourself. All right. Their spyware firm breached. Earlier this month, we covered the shutdown of Let Me Spy, a Polish spyware developer, after attackers breached its servers and deleted customer data. Now, TechCrunch received a message from an unnamed hacker group describing how it compromised another spyware vendor, the Brazilian-owned Web Detective. Using a flaw in its client dashboard layout, the attackers proceeded to download every dashboard record, letting them delete enrolled devices and view customer email addresses. An analysis by DDoS secrets of exfiltrated datasets showed the service had over 76,000 devices enrolled. A further analysis by TechCrunch showed the app is largely a repackaged version of the spyware owned spy. All right. So a couple of things here. Um, one, I got I got to be honest with y'all. Uh, where's my tinfoil hat? Tinfoil hat, Cherry. My mind immediately, immediately went to like, um. I don't want to say spicy, but my mind immediately went to, um, you know, just, I, I don't know. I don't know what the right word is, but you'll have to uh, uh, tell me what word it is. But okay, so Brazilian phone spyware was hacked. Re remember, when we think spyware, like top tier spyware, um, we think uh, Pegasus Group. Uh, there's another one that was out of Israel. I can't remember, but like Israel has been reigning supreme on you know, really, really effective commercial grade uh, or industrial grade spyware. Uh, China obviously has a really great espionage angle, but we don't hear about mobile spyware very often on on Apple, right? Definitely uh, harder to crack. Uh, with Android, we do see a lot of like APK malicious files, info stealers, etc. This Brazilian company made a spyware and they have been attacked, right? So the security company in Brazil was hacked and then all of their victims' devices data was deleted from the server, okay? Um, they claim to have had uh, compromised over 76,000 um, devices. So if you're living in South America, I know the Simply Cyber community is pretty uh, limited in South America. We have some Colombian representation, occasionally Argentina, but for the most part, uh, we don't have big presence there. So uh, whoever's listening to this, unlikely. Um, I do like the uh, hashtag here. Uh, sorry, visually to Kennedy and Jaden, but, but the point is spyware is disgusting. Okay. Whether you're using it for corporate espionage, political um extortion or you're just a scumbag and you're installing it on victims devices so you can like creep on them uh it's not good it's it's a very invasive privacy disrupting uh technology and it, it looks like somebody in kind of an ideologically motivated way uh was done having it now i want to tell you two things okay one um if you've read nicole pelroth's book this is how they tell me the world ends. I, I recommend it pr pretty often. It's a fantastic book. It's so good. It, it reads like a political spy thriller, but it's all it's all true. Okay. And if someone wants a book recommendation, uh, I'll I'll bring it up on stream. Um, but she goes to Brazil and like it's pretty impressive. Like uh, the Brazilians are very good. There's like a whole you know really good group of hardcore, mature, sophisticated. Uh, skilled cybersecurity practitioners down there. Now, here if you didn't know that, now you know, right? Now, here's the second thing you should know, okay? Everything about this would appear ideologically motivated, okay? And it seems like an isolated incident of somebody who is pro-privacy, anti-stalker, and using their skills to hack these people. And there is a skill set down in Brazil, as I just mentioned, that could accomplish this particular attack. Now, the tinfoil hat in me, the tinfoil hat in me immediately went, okay, so Brazil is part of this BRICS contingent. BRICS is like this kind of alternative to Western civilization thing. Uh, BRICS, right? Brazil's 
uh, part of that. Um, and now they have this technology that's like spyware, uh, which would be very powerful if you're doing like first world power, um, you know, initial espionage, trying to find stuff out. So maybe this was uh, covered as a ideologically motivated one off F stalkerware type thing. But in reality, it's a much more elaborate espionage way for uh, bricks to get kind of kneecapped a little bit of having uh, some capability that they have in this case um, spyware installed all over the place to to um, to dis dismantle or disrupt that capability again completely speculative no indication I think what I just said at the beginning about the individual who who wanted to take an ideologically motivated approach is probably the case in this instance but I'm just telling you how my brain works and like that's the first thing I thought of I said ooh. That's interesting, like fun way to, to cover it up. Fashion! All right, a TLDR, if you're working in Brazil, you should be aware of this. If you work in, um, you know, uh, uh, like politics, you, you might want to be aware of this. Microsoft Entra ID privilege escalation exploit. Researchers at SecureWorks released a technical report detailing the exploit. This allows a threat actor to redirect authorization codes from an abandoned URL, which they could then use to obtain access tokens. From there, they could call the Power Platform API to elevate privileges. Microsoft patched the issues, and SecureWorks released an open source tool to let organizations scan for abandoned reply URLs used in the approach. No evidence attackers use this method in the wild. All right, hold on. I'm, I'm having to pull up the story as, as they're saying it. So, SecureWorks wrote a report. Again, guys, love. I, here's one thing that our industry does. Um, here's one thing our industry does that's like awesome. And they've been doing it for probably, I don't know, like 10 years, maybe 15 years. Um, but really, in the last like five, six years, it's gone gangbusters. A lot of the major firms will have security researchers on staff who are just doing security research. And it's it's part of marketing so they can release these reports about how awesome they are. And then you're like, get interested in their business and their products and stuff. But I love it, right? SecureWorks um, wrote this research and they uncovered how Microsoft Entra ID can be exploited to elevate privileges. Now, if you're not familiar, Microsoft Entra ID is a reskin. It's a renaming of Azure Active Directory. Don't ask me why they changed the name. I'm sure BSEC um, has a, uh, an idea. I feel like he's hooked into Microsoft for some reason. But they changed it to Entra ID, and it's basically identity and access management for Azure Cloud Services, right? Now, elevated privilege. This is where you have access to King Victory's account as a general user, and then you bump it up um, to a privileged user whether that's domain admin, Azure Active Directory admin, tenant admin, global admin, right? Like there's different levels. And as we uh, approach this kind of anti, um, antitrust, zero trust um, architecture approach, the, the, the roles within Azure are many, many roles. It's not just finance, like the simple kind of um, childish way to think of it is like, oh, marketing and finance and, and you know, IT, so you have privilege. Like it's it's not that simple anymore. Okay, it's much more like you have access to like this blade inside of Azure. You have access to this in Azure, and a lot of times you have to like couple the permissions to be able to do the things you need. So I'm not saying it's overly complicated, but it is much more granular inside of Azure. And by the way, this is why being a specialist in Azure. And understanding specifically identity and access management in Azure is a pretty valuable skill uh, currently in our in our world. These individuals discovered a way to exploit uh, and get privileged ID, which basically means you could elevate. Now, like to my point, though, elevate how? I mean, you don't go from general user to uh, global tenant admin, right? I, I, I wouldn't think so. Uh, we've got this nice little graphic. I'll tell you in about five seconds whether or not this actually... Sometimes they throw graphics up and it has nothing to do with what the story is. Um, I mean, it, it possibly is. It looks like API calls to Power Apps um, and they're exploiting some type of API um, call into Power Apps. Um, and the middle tier service uh, gives the elevated privileges. So, yep. So this 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 graphic is 100% visual of what's happening, and it basically looks like 
Um, there's a breakdown in the middle here where it's validating who's making the initial request. Uh, the cool thing is if you're using Azure, if you're using Entra ID, uh, definitely go check out this secure works open source tool that should load in a minute. Okay. I'll drop a link in chat. This is a GitHub. You can check right now. Hold on. Check right now. Not right now. Wait till the stream ends and coordinate with it. Don't just run this gangbusters in your cloud environment without checking it out first. Um, to Entra ID issue. Okay, here we go. So I love this. So they've released a tool that you can use to basically check whether or not um, this this you're you're vulnerable to this uh, compromise, right? So good on you. Way to go, SecureWorks. Like what you're doing. All right, let's do the mid roll. And now a word from our sponsor, App Omni. SaaS cyber attacks are prevalent and often go unnoticed until data loss or breaches occur. Sign-ins from an unusual IP address, stolen session tokens, these security risks can lurk in the shadows and put your entire SaaS estate at risk. Don't wait for a breach to secure your SaaS data. App Omni helps security teams to detect suspicious activity, decide what activities to be alerted on, and receive guided remediation. Learn how at appomni.com. Malicious. All right, it's the mid-roll. All right, guys, we're at the bottom of the hour. We're nailing it every show where mid-roll happens just about 30 minutes into the episode. Love it, love it, love it. Guys, thank you all so very much for being here. We're at 328 beautiful souls right now. Uh, we are just straight crushing it, consistently over 300. So um, I appreciate it, and I, I just really grateful for all of you. Thank you to the stream sponsors, Barricade Cyber, Panopsi, and Anti-Siphon Trade. And really quickly, Anti-Siphon Trade, led by Black Hills Information Security, is awesome. Uh, they are disrupting traditional cyber training by providing high-quality and cutting-edge education to everyone, regardless of their financial position. Follow the link in the description below um, and go to training, pay what you can training. You can check out all their training, but I want to call your attention to the pay what you can courses. Do not let your financial situation dictate what you can and cannot get access to. These pay what you can courses are seriously disrupting the industry. Three of them are taught by John Strand himself. Love that guy. He's the keynote of Simply CyberCon. Um, you know, I, I love his conference in Deadwood. Like just the guy is setting the tone for how we should all behave in the industry. Uh, go check it out. Take some of his courses. I've taken one. It was f phenomenal. And just like my favorite saying, um, if you're interested in the course I took, I've got a video for that on the channel. I did the active defense and cyber deception one. If you just Google or you look on YouTube for me, active defense, cyber deception, you will get that video. Guys, want to say thank you to all of you. If you do have a second and you're getting educational value and or entertainment value, Hit the like button right now. It only takes a second, but the thing is, it signals to YouTube that you like cyber content and you like this show, and 300 other people like cyber content and like this show. It will reach out to other people who like cyber content that do not know about the show, and that's how we grow the community and that's how we help each other. So do your part. Go hit the like button right now and pay it forward. Love the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Jaya currently with the baton. Jai is going to tag someone in chat. It looks like they've passed it to Dubs Codified Likeness Utility. Dubs Codified Likeness Utility. Jesus Christ. Ah! All right, Eric Taylor with a two. <coughs> Eric Taylor with a $200 super chat. I can't stop the music from Simple Minds, but Jesus. Um. All right. Thanks, Eric Taylor. Thanks, Barricade Cyber Solutions with the Super Chat. Sponsoring the show. Bringing the heat. Love it. Love it. Love it. Uh, thank you, Eric. Very nice of you. Very kind. Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Uh, Jaya's Tub. Uh, so Dubs Codified Likeness Utility. Go on LinkedIn. Share your cyber story. Use the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Everybody, here's your, here's your ask. Here's how you can use this. 
Go on to LinkedIn, find Jaya's post, find Dubs Codified Likeness Utilities post. You can find it by searching for this hashtag. Once you find the hashtag, comment on the post, connect with the poster, connect with the people in the comments. You will now be a person in the comments, so everybody else will connect with you. In two weeks' time, you will build a meaningful, professional network on LinkedIn that supercharges your feed, gives you access to resources, supportive community, and insights. Believe me, it's one of the best things you can do right now. I, I like, <clears throat> I think I like blew my throat out somehow. Jesus, I was not prepared for that. All right, guys, Tidbits Tuesday. Every Tuesday, I share a little bit about myself. Um, I don't even know what to share. Um, oh, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, you know what? I, I take pride in this. So the blog post wasn't up today. You can see the Chiron down the bottom um, saying it's not preloaded. Guys, it, it's a perfect example. Do not. I don't let perfection get in the way of progress. I, I am so driven. Um, you know, like I just as a tidbits Tuesday, like I just I just love moving forward, making progress, trying to do something good. Um, and, you know, it's it's been well received. So um, maybe that's a little bit more motivational than a little tidbits about me. But uh, I just wanted to share it with you. Um, so anyways, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Eric Taylor, BSEC, Jesse. Uh, hey, do me a favor, uh, Barricade Cyber. Send me a shirt. I'd love to rep Barricade Cyber on stream. All right, let's keep rolling. Just packages found in Rust Registry. We've covered a number of malicious NPM packages in the past, but this latest finding shows that exploiting the software supply chain knows no programming language bounds. Researchers at Phylum discovered seven libraries uploaded to the Rust Crate Registry. Once installed, all packages transmitted OS-level data to hard-coded Telegram channels. It seems this was part of an early stage campaign in an attempt to get the packages installed on a wide variety of environments. The packages appeared in the registry in mid-August and were subsequently removed. All right, hold on. We got a lot going on here. I'm sweating my A off right now. Wow. Uh, give me one second. All right, hold on one second. All right, so I, because I have to pull these things up, right? Uh Russ Mal, okay, first of all, this is obviously AI generated mid journey, but whatever the prompt was, I love it. Like show me like laser eyes crab. Like it looks like it's in the Sanctum Centaurum from uh, Dr. Strange in the background. Holy crap. Um, I, I missed the whole story on this one. Okay, so what are we doing here? Russ Mauer staged on crates.io. Okay, so crates.io, I'm not a 100% sure, but I think it's tied to Docker containers. Um, it looks like it's doing typo squatting on popular packages. It is, okay. So you can see here, like Postgres is a popular database and it's P-O-S-T-G-R-E-S but they have one called P-O-S-T-G-R-E-S-S. -S. Um, so basically typo squatting is where, you know, it's capital, you know, or, you know, it's like capital one and the L in capital one is a one, right? Or it's Microsoft and instead of a, in, uh, a, a, a C, it, you know, it's an O or something like that, right? It, typo squatting has been around for a long time. Um, so just be mindful of that. Basically, here's the deal. What what are we doing here? All right. So, uh, okay. So, BSEC saying that this has actually already been cleaned up, which is fantastic. But there is a lesson learned here. Okay. Here is the deal. I'm a bad guy. I put malware on crates.io or GitHub or whatever, and I name it um, Postgres with two S's. Right. It's just straight malware. So my idea is that. Um, some, you know, unwitting dev or somebody in a hurry downloads it thinking it's actually the correct one and they're going to install it and load it and they're going to click all the permissions, all the approvals right through the permissions in order to allow it to go, allow it to go, right? This is, I mean, this is one way of getting initial infection, right? Sometimes we send a crafty email or we throw USB drives in the in the driveway or whatever. Like there's different ways to do it but this is one initial infection approach. Now, it is very much a, you know, you get what you get. Like you don't know who your victim's gonna be. Obviously you're targeting, you're targeting devs 
who are going to be doing software development, who are going to be likely at tech startups, right? Or it's not, it's not exclusively tech startups, but you get what I'm saying. But you're also going to get students who are screwing around or, you know, a, a, a 14 year old who's trying to like teach themselves Docker, right? So as a malicious threat actor, you're literally just throwing stuff against the wall and hoping that you get something. So um, that's the deal with that. Um, you know, basically you can educate end users and say, Hey, listen, or not end users. Like this is an opportunity where you could target research and engineering devs. If your faculty, like, actually, you know what? I teach at the Citadel every single day. Um, or excuse me on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but every single class, I always start the class with some relevant, um, uh, news story, right? Like from, from the briefings, this is going to be the one that I show the students in a few hours because literally they're computer science, like many of them are computer science students and they're freshmen. They may not know this. And this is a great opportunity to educate. Remember our job as practitioners is not to call our end users idiots or stupid or anything like that. It's to find a way to meaningfully connect with them and help them understand and modify their own behavior on their own volition. Right? Okay. So that's, what's up with this, this, this type of attack has been around forever. Okay. It's just now it's on dockers. Ooh, like wee, whoop -dee. like it's, it's just a reskin on an old, uh, an old, ha um, hack or what, not a hack, but an old attack uh, vector. Blackberry and Sentinel-1 could be acquired. Over the weekend, Reuters sources said the private equity firm Veritas Capital made an acquisition offer for Blackberry, the once iconic phone maker turned security vendor. No word on the offer, but the stock market reacted to the news by raising Blackberry's market cap to $3.1 billion. Meanwhile, Sentinel-1 hired the bank Catalyst Partners to advise on acquisition talks with several prospective buyers. The cloud security startup Wiz confirmed it's considering a bid for the company. Okay, <clears throat> there's a lot. <clears throat> Jesus, that two hundred dollars super chat like destroyed my throat somehow. I don't know how. I think I just like flexed and like everything went to uh, sideways. Okay, so guys, there's a lot going on in this story. You've got to remember, okay. The cybersecurity industry. When you hear numbers like. Cybersecurity industry is projected to be two trillion dollars by 2027. When they're talking about those numbers, they're sure as crap not talking about our salaries. What's up, Kathy Chambers? Good to see you in chat. They're not talking about our salaries, guys. They're talking about the ridiculous amounts of money that are being thrown around for security technology companies. If you went to Black Hat, you know Sentinel One had one of the first booths right when you walk in the business hall. Do you know what? Those booths. They're not free. They cost an A load of money. And the further back you go and the smaller the booth you get, the less money it costs, obviously. But front and center, the footprint of like a small uh, city, that's expensive. So they've got tons and tons of money. Now, I have heard, again, pure speculation, Sentinel One is actually kind of um, hemorrhaging a little bit, right? Silent, uh, Blackberry known for their little, uh, Blackberry phones a million years ago had actually acquired Silence. So if, si if Veritas is talking about acquiring Silence and Sentinel one, it sounds like they're trying to collapse, um, EDR solutions and not corner the market, but consolidate the EDR solutions. I've never heard of this tech startup whiz as a cloud security company, but obviously you have to imagine that, um, they're, they're looking to get some type of EDR solution as part of their cloud security uh, portfolio. Um, I don't know, guys. Here's the deal. EDR solutions at the top level, so like your Cobalt, um, not Cobalt Strike, your um, CrowdStrike, your uh, Sentinel-1, your uh, FireEye, right? Your... your um, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, right? They, they all have their short, their shortcomings. They all have their benefits. They all have their weaknesses. Um, you know, people can complain or whatever, uh, but they're, they're, it's big money. And when you are a company and you're trying to grow, you have two options. You can acquire a capability to give you a market advantage, which costs a lot of money, or you can develop it in-house. And I've talked about this on the show before, and this gets into business and economics and all that other stuff. But to acquire it, you can buy it today and start selling it tomorrow. To build it yourself, it takes time, money, resources, 
and you're not for, you're not going to get to market very soon. So like you have to weigh those two, um, those two approaches, right? And and acquisition is a big one, especially right now where like interest rates are wicked high, and there was a consolidation of wealth with a lot of wealthy people. So VC funds, angel investors, they're all over the place looking to spend money. So this doesn't surprise me. Um, Anyways, TLDR for us as an industry, all we're going to do as practitioners is get some popcorn, sit on the sideline and see where this goes. If Sentinel-1 does get acquired and Silence does get acquired, it's going to take them 12 to 18 months to um, to compress the tech into like a new solution, right? Because it's going to take three months for them just to figure out how to like move the businesses into each other. Then another three months to like, unfortunately, identify redundancy, lay people off you know, whatever, which sucks, but it's going to happen. And then uh, figure out what parts of the business they want to keep, what parts they don't want to keep. And, th and then you go another six months of roadmap. And then finally, they're going to come to market, probably Black Hat, DEF CON with like, <laughs> not vaporware, but like, here's what's coming out in Q4 2024. That's what I would expect to happen here. I uh, also want to say shout out to Mariana Albright, who's made it to the hashtag team live. Mariana, love having you here. Appreciate you being on Team Replay, but welcome to the live. Uh, absolutely cool. OpenAI launches ChatGPT Enterprise. While many organizations and employees have already tried OpenAI's ChatGPT, the release largely has only offered consumer-grade tooling. The new enterprise-focused offering will offer the same capabilities but provide a new admin console. This offers the ability to manage employees, see usage statistics, and set up templates. The tier also offers unlimited access to advanced data analysis, which offers advanced tooling for that specific use case. This comes after Microsoft released Bing Chat Enterprise back in July. KM okay, I mean, <clears throat> like, no surprise, okay? Um, ChatGPT is used by a lot of people. I, I think it was Microsoft. I know Microsoft owns Bing, but I'm pretty sure, like, I'm I'm like 99% sure Microsoft um invested like 40 billion dollars into OpenAI, right? So my understanding is Microsoft owns like f almost 50% of OpenAI and Microsoft might be altruistic and righteous but they're not. And you know what they are into? Great cash, homie. Making money. Actually, I saw Microsoft's annual earnings and they made like um Forty billion dollars or twenty billion dollars. I, th I think it's I think it's twenty billion dollars. But their three main business lines are Office three sixty five, LinkedIn, Xbox, and Azure. Okay, so if they invested forty billion into OpenAI, you better believe they want to start squeezing that stone and get they want to squeeze that lemon and get the juice out. You know what I'm saying? The juice has got to be worth the squeeze, Microsoft. So yeah, enterprise version. People have been saying you can't put anything into ChatGPT because you don't know where it's going. Well, no problem. Let's offer them a solution and then let's charge for it. Um, I will say this. Um, I, they didn't say this in the report, but you would be you would be um, foolish if you did not think that there was going to be any type of reporting on the back end. So management can see what kind of queries are being dropped into the enterprise chat GPT and who's doing them. You're obviously going to have to authenticate in order to access it. So. I'm not saying you're going to be dropping uh, weird stuff in there that's going to get you fired, but like this is an enterprise application. There's clearly going to be um, um, monitoring on it. Uh, so, you know, be mindful of that. And if you're a privacy person or a cyber person, frankly, you should probably ask, like as I'm, I'm thinking about this on the fly, you should probably ask about that reporting capability uh, because data loss prevention, right? If some if somebody's asking uh, ChatGPT in the enterprise one, hey, can you please, you know, like the fi here's the thing, right? Say the finance people are putting in forecasting things and asking for data science models back so they can show cool infographics, right? Well, what stops someone in marketing or someone in uh, IT to say, ChatGPT, please also dump that for me, right? Like, are they going to have data isolation, I doubt it, right? So now you might have this permissions issue where people who don't need access to HR files or financial forecasts or intellectual property are going to be able to access it. I'd be curious, I'd be curious. They didn't mention uh, data classification in here, right?
Something to think about. MSD bot malware expands to a new audience. The KMSD bot botnet first appeared in November, largely targeting cloud providers and private gaming servers before transitioning to targeting educational institutions. No. An analysis of an update to the botnet by Akamai researcher Larry W. Cashdollar shows it recently added new capabilities to target IoT. It added support for several new CPU architectures and supports Telnet scanning. KMSD bot uses brute force password attacks using a list of common passwords to get into IoT devices with default credentials. Oh my god. Hello? Offboard KMSD bot, Mirai called, you stole its thunder. This thing, dude, this is basically Mirai reskinned. Like, don't don't come at me and call yourself KMSD bot when you're basically, you know, 2014's Mirai botnet. Like, get out of here with that noise. Did you get the t-shirts made? Jesus. So here's the deal. This bot, it's effective. It's scanning the internet for Telnet opens uh, and then using brute force passwords. You can go on uh, you can go on GitHub and pull down Mirai botnet right now, right? Um, I, I missed the part. I guess this is targeting schools. Um, I, I don't like that. Uh, here's the deal, guys. Um, this doesn't sound, this sounds like effective in the sense that it's um, scanning effectively and it's compromising telnet you may think that telnet is a deprecated uh service and it doesn't really appear anymore that's not true a lot of iot devices a lot of simple devices are running telnet in order to allow for you know automatic maintenance and patches and updates it here's the deal oh thank you very much um here's the deal it basically um makes it easy for the technology vendors to manage the devices right if here's the deal guys <laughs> the less secure and this is this is a fact that we have to deal with as practitioners the more excuse me the less secure a device is the easier it is to maintain and use because there's less roadblocks in the way to use it or maintain it so telnet is is great right from a maintenance perspective we got to push a firmware update no worries just connect and push you don't need to authenticate no need to deal with certificate revocation nah don't sweat that brah just push right but the problem is anyone including kmsd bot can push and and uh as it was once called mirai all right um here's the deal um i would say looks like KMSD is using its compromised assets in a distributed denial of service attack, which basically means say your ring doorbell gets picked up in this botnet or your Google Nest thermostat because it runs Telnet and you didn't do anything. Well, maybe you're like, well, what's the big deal? I can still change the temperature in my house. Who gives a crap? Well, the problem is your device is now being used to like knock a school offline or knock a hospital offline or knock a financial services company offline, which, you know, maybe that does impact you financially down the road, okay? So you shouldn't opt into a botnet simply because it doesn't really affect you, uh, right? Uh, you And by the way, so this is a tough one. You and I, right? Bill B, Nick Barker, Paul S, Fallon Watts, we can all stand up a little scanner and scan our home network and see if Telnet's listening. We can do an Nmap scan across our network uh, IP range, right? 192, 168, slash 16, Look for port 23, go get some tacos and come back and you'll find out what you got. But you know what? My Aunt Dorothea cannot scan her home network and tell if there's Telnet in there. So this is a little bit of a tricky one. Again, um, you got to be more mindful of internet facing assets. You can scan your Aunt Dorothea's uh, internet facing router and stuff for Telnet or any devices that happen to be facing the internet. Small businesses would probably fall victim to this quite a bit too. Uh, but anyways, that's the TLDR here. Employees can be a stressful process, but it can also introduce significant security risks. This week on the CISO Series podcast. All right. All right. So that's going to do it for today's news. We had uh, we were at 85% capability, but I think we did all right, guys. Um, we really need to work on your aunt. Yeah, I know. I love my Aunt Dorothea. All right. Um Okay, guys, really quickly, if you were here just for the news, thank you very much. Uh, it's going to be a short show today because I've got uh, to head over to the Citadel for teaching. 
I will do two minutes. I'll do two minutes of jaw jacking just so I can do the transition. I also want to say shout out uh, to Kimberly really quickly uh, and let you guys know that uh, she's helping me with a couple things here. This Tuesday, I haven't scheduled it yet, but this Tuesday, Simply Cyber Live is going to be welcoming Jeffrey Smith. Uh, we're going to be talking about the current state of cybersecurity insurance. If you don't think cyber insurance is relevant or matters, you more than anyone else needs to attend this show. It is dominating and it's very, very important and it's driving cybersecurity programs. If you are a GRC person, this is this is um, must see content. If you're a cyber practitioner, it's worth seeing. But GRC people definitely need to giddy up on this. All right, guys. That's going to do it for today's news. I want to thank you all for being here. 324 of you. Thanks for the super chat. Let me transition to jaw jacking and we'll do two minutes of that. All right, everybody. Let me get chat up really quickly. Again, I got to work on that every single time. All right. All right, let's 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 uh let's do uh, the fastest two minutes in cyber really quickly. Thanks everybody for being uh, being here today. Um, Marcus Kyler saying perhaps this is a dumb question right off the rip. Marcus, it is not a dumb question. Whatever you're about to ask is not a dumb question. How cumbersome would it be to just open that port to do necessary updates and then close it right afterwards? No, that's a solid idea. But the thing is, Marcus, how do you communicate to the device to tell it to open the port? That's the challenge, right? It, the device itself isn't going to know like, oh, time for maintenance. Um, I mean, I guess you could set a, a timer. So like every night at midnight, it opens up, but then you don't know what time zone it's going to be in. And it becomes like a maintenance issue with that. So uh, it's a tough problem to solve. What they really should do is uh, suck it up and do port 22 with certificates. Level the bar. If a threat actor gets the certificate, okay, that sucks. But at least they had to do the effort to get the certificate, right? Um, yes, uh, base case, if you want, um, if you want to base, go ahead, like t base case, you tell me how much do you want me to say versus how much do you want to say? I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy leading the charge. Um, oh, no problem. B sec. All right, guys. Uh, Hey, Nick Barker. Love having you here. Carrie's got a question. The live show is at four 30 that Thursday or today for that. What you put for a live, you normally don't have a live on Tuesday. No. So my live is on Thursdays at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. Thursday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time um, is Simply Cyber Live. Always Thursdays on 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. Okay, guys. So really quickly, uh, Base Case shared in chat that he's starting a new job again. Love it, love it, love it. So check it out. Let me tell you about Base Case's job. Base Case will be the cybersecurity content manager for Haiku. Hmm, that job sounds familiar. What is that? Oh, that's my job because I'm going to be going full time. I need more time for the Simply Cyber community. And the only way I could do that was to stop working there. But I am what I would consider uh, a professional with high integrity. So I said to Haiku, listen, let me backfill myself. I gave a six week notice. I said, let me backfill myself. Um, and I hand picked a, a couple people um, that I knew could crush the job. And Base Case was absolutely one of those. Base Case came in like a wrecking ball. And Base Case just straight destroyed the interview. He's just like, looks like the, like the Hulk or a juggernaut, like running through walls, just like doosh, doosh, doosh. And he won the he won the job all on his own, and uh, but my point here is, guys, I tell you all the time, it's about networking, right? Base earned the job himself. Base found out about the job because I literally said, "Who do I know that could crush this job?" I know Base Case could. <laughs> Are you interested? Yes. Let's set up an interview. There's the interview. People at the, at the business that isn't me, um, like and approve and hire. This is networking, okay? Base case doesn't. Base case didn't uh, mod the community and help me out and uh, and do all the friend stuff and Trace Lab CTF at DefCon last year because he was like playing the long game for a job that I might get him. No, 
he he contributes into the network and when opportunities arise they make sense this is the power of networking y'all and congratulations haiku is going to be really well served base is awesome all right guys i got one more minute and then i gotta giddy up i love this song this is my i think this is my favorite song by the midnight by the way Amazon Fire Sticks use Telnet. Oh, groove a sec. Thank you for letting us know. 2023, y'all. It's here. All right. We do have to get um, we do have to get uh, new emotes and new sound effects. That's on my um, agenda for next week when I'm full time. Yeah, base case playing the ultimate long game. <laughs> Two years. Oh my God, my throat hurts. Again, Eric Taylor, thanks for the super chat. Uh, Barricade Cyber, Panopsi, Anti-Siphon, thanks so much for all the uh, stream support. For the Simply Cyber community members, thank you all. Squad members, thank you all. You guys are fantastic. Guys, I gotta go teach the next generation about how to secure all the things. Got the Citadel cup. I'm gonna try to drink out of my Citadel coffee mug on Tuesdays and uh, Thursdays just to visually tell everybody I got to go everybody though um, thank you all so very much I'm Jerry your chat until next time which will be tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern time <laughs> stay secure later everybody everybody I hope you enjoyed that content keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other simply cyber community resources we have the discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going you can connect with me directly on LinkedIn and also every single weekday morning on the simply cyber channel we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings 8 a.m. Eastern time as well as Thursday at 4 30 p.m. we're doing live stream interviews with industry experts and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning 